Joining us now is Adam Osborne, formerly of Osborne Computers and now CEO of Paperback Software, Inc., and Laurie Harp, CEO of Vector Graphic. Gary? You know, Adam, uh, you and Laurie have been in this business for a long time, as long as I have. And in fact, I remember you uh, when we were at Intel, we were working on some documentation together, and that must have been in 73. That's right. Yes. And uh, I know that a lot of viewers probably have some questions about, you know, is it possible really to get into this industry now, or has it been completely dominated by companies like IBM and Tandy and so forth? Is there a place uh, for, for a young inventor to really make, make his mark? Well, I think that all depends really in what area. If you want to build a microcomputer, it's probably not a good idea at this point because it's going to be the clash of the titans now. Mm -hmm. There's nothing high-tech about microcomputers anymore. It's very simply, you know, it's like building a washing machine or a refrigerator, quite honestly. It's the economics of volume and reliability, and that's it. That's the end of it. If, on the other hand, you want to go into some other area, good grief, you know, there's probably more opportunities today than there's ever been. It, it, it's just that you're better off uh, building razor blades rather than razors. If the opportunities are not in computers, where are these areas in which there are opportunities? Peripherals, add-ons, software. You, know, you can make a lot of money with extra cards that will fit into a popular computer, attachments, peripherals. Particularly the software industry now, it's very much in its infancy right now. The organization and methodology uh, is going to undergo massive change, but on the other hand, there will be probably 10 to 100 times as much software sold every year, five or six years from now, as there is now. Obviously, that's hypergrowth. Obviously, that's where there are, there are the opportunities. Adam, you talked about the titans, by the way. Who do you see as the titans right now? Well, IBM's obviously there. I'm quite certain that AT&T are going to come in to challenge them in a big way, and there will be one or more Japanese companies that come in as well, and they're going to dominate the market. Laura, you are in the business of making computers now. Uh, do you agree with, with Adam's perspective? Uh, yes, I would say, you know, what he said is pretty accurate. And uh, to just go back to your first question, is it possible for uh, companies to get started today? I think the costs involved are going to be prohibitive. When we started our company, you know, you could do it with $5,000, a lot of sleepless nights, and you would be rolling. Today, that's an impossibility. I mean, capitalization has to be several million dollars, and you still, I don't think, uh, have enough money to really get enough critical mass in short enough of a period of time to, you know, to be one of the contenders. But uh, the peripheral market, and I think especially in the area of communications, um, is going to be extremely significant to uh, make add-on devices that link the kind of systems that have been installed to, you know, together. When you talk about communications, you mean like communications with the source or CompuServe and hooking uh, small computers up with the... Yes, uh, yeah. that's mm -hmm. part of it, right. The, I think the another, another important point is that uh, large companies, the Titans, really only get into uh, an area of software or hardware when it's been proven to be successful. Uh, IBM is a good example of that. Oh, absolutely. And uh, the small garage shop operations have opportunities mm -hmm. where uh, the large uh, company is just not willing to, to put the effort. Yeah. And well, so there's, those are the spin-off areas that I think there will, will be. There's also price consideration as well. When people are talking about investing thousands of dollars, they tend to be very careful about where they're buying because it's an investment. When they're buying a $50 product or even up to maybe sometimes a couple of hundred dollars, they say, what the heck? If, if it doesn't work, I've learned something. Mm -hmm. That's why a lot of these very inexpensive computers sold as well as they did later just to collect dust. There never will be an IBM in software, uh, for example, because you're now dealing, eventually you'll be dealing with $50 products. And the rest of the vicariousness of human nature, everyone's going to want to buy that little something different. So, uh, and in it's fact, only a $50 investment. That's where a lot of the know? real inventors are going yeah. to mm -hmm. show up would be in the software area. Right. It's, it's a comment you just made about the number of co uh, small computers that are gathering dust. Do you have any just ideas of what you think the number of, or the percentage, say, of personal computers that let's say below the thousand dollar mark, they're actually being used uh, productively, you know, in say a home room? I would say probably 50% are catching dust. Mm -hmm. You know, I have no way to totally substantiate that because I don't think a lot of research has been done on non-utilization of computers. But I personally know several people who had gone out in the, you know, early days, bought a Radio Shack, bought, you know, the early available computers and are going out now. They bring them home they really suddenly realize they don't have quite the need 
they thought they had for a system. I would say probably 50 percent. I don't know if you agree with that, Adam, but... Uh, well, we've done a little bit of research in this area. It does tend to vary quite a lot by brand. The uh, ZX80 and ZX81, probably more than any, are now collecting dust simply because they were bought initially by people who just wanted to find out what a computer was all about and they spent a hundred dollars doing it. Okay. So that it, it, it served its purpose, so the fact it's collecting dust is no longer an indictment of the product. Mm -hmm. uh, the Commodore 64, we find, pr more than any is collecting dust, and that's a lot of it to do with reliability problems where people just say, what, you know, they're just not going to get it mm -hmm. fixed when it stops working. It only cost two hundred dollars in the first place. Mm -hmm. It seems like a lot of the inventiveness that's going to go into software is really going to be uh, around uh, products that really make personal computers are useful in the home mm -hmm. and take them out of the closet. Well, if they haven't been, uh, they haven't been purchased yet, but actually make, when they, when they come into a home, that they're actually used in, in, a, in a way that's uh, productive. Is that a concern of the industry, Adam? You suggested, well, it doesn't matter, something like the, the Sinclair. Well, it, it served its purpose. Or are people in, the, in this industry concerned about making sure that, uh, I assume you want people to use these products, because then they'll go out and buy the peripherals and buy the software and so mm -hmm. on? Uh, well, it depends really um, on each company in what direction the company is going into. We, for example, have no intention of going into the home computer market where, uh, you know, you go into this under $500 rat race. I mean, the economies of scales and manufacturing um, must, you know, is, companies such as ours can never accomplish that. So, um, you know, from my vantage point, it's not an area I'm interested in. I mean, anything under $3,000 is, you know, an absolute no you know, for our company. We, we hear about the falling out that is starting to take place and will take place in the computer field, and Adam People cite your company is, is one of those examples. Is that, in fact, uh, something that has to happen and is going to happen? Well, Osborne Computer's failure was nothing to do with falling out. It was nothing to do with uh, industry uh, competition or collapse. The company, plain and simple, committed suicide. Um, all I will say about it right now is that everything you have read in the paper you can hit the reset button on because it's not right. This is not yet the right time for me to say what really happened, so I'm not going to. So you don't, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, uh, no, but uh, very specifically, y your answer is partially yes and partially no. Uh, if IBM were not consuming 70% of the market, which they are right now, today. You know, the numbers that you read about are actually inaccurate. IBM dominates the market far more than any of the statistics you read. What I like to say, you know, I've said before, is that IBM is one. There is no second. You know, after mm -hmm. IBM, the, it picks up again at somewhere like fifth or sixth. <laughs> you know, if they weren't there, clearly a lot of other people would be able to do a lot better. But on the other hand, if you take 30% of the market, it is so huge that it will support an awful lot of people mm -hmm. who are selling three, four, five, ten thousand computers a month. Mm -hmm. uh, they're sure, there'll be a shakeout, but then you know, th there's been a shakeout in the hardware industry. Gary, you remember a lot of the early companies. Where's I Insight? You know, where's yeah. where's Mint? Yes, I mean, yeah. it's, it's been going on for years. It's nothing new. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, you mentioned IBM, and of course IBM is a key player. We're going to soon meet a gentleman who played a key role at IBM and in the IBM competitors. That's coming up in just a moment.